All right, um, so it's really an incredible honor and pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Marty Stein. Um, I could probably spend the rest of the afternoon going over the accolades that I have for Marty. It's been actually 22 years now since I came here as an intern and met Marty Stein at that time, and he continues uh, to be a mentor to me. Uh, up until his very recent official retirement, he was our son's pediatrician, and I think there can be no greater testimony to what we think of Marty Stein than to entrust him with our son's health. Uh, now I'll go back on script and tell you that Dr. Stein is a professor of pediatrics at UCSD. He's been on the faculty since 1975 as both a general pediatrician and a specialist in developmental and, pe and uh, de uh, excuse me, in developmental and behavioral pediatrics. He is the author of a very well-renowned book called Encounters with Children, Pediatric Behavior and Development, which is actually part of our residency training curriculum. I hope it still is, Marty, is that right? Um, he's the past president of the Society for Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics. He's the recipient of the C. Anderson Aldrich Award from the American Academy of Pediatrics for his contributions to child development. He has sat on, I don't know how many national and international panels and boards to help uh, come up with policies for children with special needs and behavioral problems. So uh, it is truly a deep honor and pleasure to welcome you to, I don't know how many conferences it's been now. I've lost track and that's a good thing, I think. So, <laughs> And I will ask you to help yourself to your bottle of wine. So thank you, Marty. <laughs> Well, just as you're all proud of your children and grandchildren, I'm proud of my students. And it has been 22 years since Paul came to San Diego, uh, right out of medical school as an intern, and it's just wonderful to see the, the progress you've made. <laughs> Good work. Uh, Not including my legs. Uh, yeah, I have to ask you about that, but I'm sure you've already explained it to the audience before I came. But I was here for the last four talks, including um, a distinguished professor from Italy, uh, and you heard uh, scientists, you heard um, both, both bench scientists and biological scientists talk about various aspects of Jacobson syndrome, including genetics and behavioral and cognitive uh, areas. I'm a clinician, so I work with patients individually, uh, like your children. For many years, I was a general primary care pediatrician for, for the last Oh, 15, 20 years, I have focused on kids with a variety of developmental disabilities, uh, both behavioral and cognitive. Uh, so my approach to a condition like uh, the uh, Q11 deletion uh, is not so much with specificity. That is, I see more sameness or shared aspects of children with a variety of genetic or non-genetic or uncertain about the genetic conditions of the brain. So many children have brain-related disabilities that affect their thinking, uh, their behavior, and their social interaction. And although there are some differences, uh, they tend to be subtle from, my, from a standpoint of a clinician. So I, I kind of look at the big picture. I try to define specific behaviors or specific intellectual problems that may help me recommend treatments. That is, that really is the value of all these labels. You know, why do we have all these labels? Well, it's so that we can cluster problems of thinking or problems of behavior and then study them and see if certain interventions work with specific conditions. I mean, that's what the scientists in this area does and I think that's the value uh, of, um, of specific diagnostic categories. Well, with that introduction, um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, lower right, you'll see the arrows. Lower right, yeah, right, thank you. Okay, with that introduction, I want to ask you a question. Which behaviors in your child with Jacobson syndrome are most challenging to you and your family, as parents, as grandparents, as others? Yes? Self-harm and harming others. Self-injury or self-harm and harming others. All right, important. Yes? Busyness or inability to 
busyness, inability to stay still, always on the go, and very hyperactive, and the effects of that, which may be safety. issues of safety, running out of the house, things like that. Yeah. Inability to communicate. Inability to communicate. So communicate both with language specifically and social communication. Okay. Good. Others. Oh, there are others. <laughs> What's it? Yeah? I say it was a little louder, please. Uh, rigidity. Rigidity, right. Being inflexible and rigid, right. Right, okay. Certainly a, a behavior that can be challenging. Yes? Stubbornness. Stubbornness, okay. <laughs> so what do you mean by stubbornness? He knows what he wants and he stands his grounds. Yeah, I mean, in some ways that's a, uh, that's a strength, but when he's always that way, <laughs> that can be challenging. <laughs> okay. And that's actually an interesting point, by the way. Now, maybe I'll try to emphasize this. I do always try to look at the strengths in children. No matter what severe, what, no matter the severity of their deficits, cognitively or behaviorally, I think it's very important to work with parents to make sure they understand where the strengths are because that's how we work with our kids. We work through their strengths. We try to help them with their deficits, but we do that by working through their strengths. Anything else? Aggressiveness. Restlessness? Aggression. Oh, aggression, okay. All right, well this is very, very similar to uh, my list. So here's my list if I had to answer that. I don't have a child uh, with Jacobson syndrome, sure but <laughs> little rig, little rig. Uh, but but um, so some of this comes from what I have read in the literature. Although, as you heard this morning, I think the literature on the behavioral phenotype of Jacobson syndrome is just emerging now with the kind of research you saw. But there's some, but also the several conferences. I don't know, Paul, if it's four or five that I've been at, and I've talked to many of the parents and grandparents and some of the kids, and from that, and I've tried to observe as well. And from that, so here's my list. And it's very similar to what you said. Hyper, and this is in no particular order, by the way. No order of, of severity or uh, frequency. Uh, and I mean, what if what what is really difficult for one family may be very different than the other. So hyperactivity, including restlessness, fidgetiness, always on the go, a short attention span, uh, a worrier. Now all of us worry, and all of our children worry. But kids with Jacobson syndrome seem to worry more. They're more anxious. Uh, they may have more fears. There may be mood changes and sadness to the point of depression. Self-injury was the first comment that was made. Uh, irritability and agitation uh, is particularly in those children who have a diagnosis on the autistic spectrum. Uh, aggression, which you can see with kids on the autistic spectrum as well as children with ADHD. Obsessions and compulsions, talk about a little, and certainly sleep problems. How many of you who have a child with Jacobson syndrome have never had any sleep problems? <laughs> One. Wow. Okay, well, we, I want to talk to you later. She does wake up. She doesn't wake up. She, she will wake up and we start. Yeah, well, that's okay. But in general, well, that's, but that's, sh obviously the rest of you have a variety of sleep problems, which we'll talk about. Sleep onset problems, multiple night awakenings, uh, screaming, that kind of thing. Uh, short duration of sleep, etc., and that's more common with Jacobson syndrome. And but you can see the variability because we have one here who has limited, uh, and there may or may not be a long or short deletion, mm -hmm. right? Yes. We never had sleep problems with them. Never. How old is your child? Two and a half. And how old is your child? Three. Three. Okay, I, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. During lunch, I'd like to talk to both of you, because I think that, 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 that is special, but I think for us, for as a group, it points out again the variability. The ver Sleeps all night. Okay. Well, you see, so I think the literature maybe overemphasizes sleep problems, because uh, not, clearly not everyone has them. Uh, okay, so that's my list, which is, wasn't so different from the list that you folks generated. And so the behaviors that are described by parents of children with Jacobson syndrome 
frequently. You heard this morning, uh, and but but I've just summarized these. So at attention seeking uh, seems to be frequently mentioned. Uh, tantrums. Uh, compulsive behaviors, and, and for some reason, the literature men mentions paper shredding. Any of your kids participate in that? Yeah. So, it's, what other compulsions do you do you find? You know, kind of a. Everything. Anyone stand out? Imitation of of objects or people. Repetitive, repetitive imitation. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. He likes to tear off the walls or when he's sleeping, he tears his blankets or his socks. Ah. Just always so that's another form of shredding, but not paper, but other other objects that are, okay. We have the same thing, shredding clothes. Shredded clothes, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, see, that's interesting because compuls compulsions and obsessions are, uh, are relatively common in children without known genetic problems, but the shredding part of it is not so prominent. I mean, I've seen lots of kids with OCD, but shredding is not prominent, I'd say. Whereas there's something about the deletion in Jacobson syndrome that makes it more prominent in some, not all. Okay, and, and certainly ADHD, which I'll talk about, and sleep problems. And what isn't on here is autistic spectrum disorder, which you heard about and should be, uh, but I'll, I'll talk about that. And, and this is kind of a premature statement. I'm not sure why I wrote it in there, but with all behaviors, um, in addition to um, applied behavioral analysis and intensive behavior modification, which we both heard about and we're going to hear about more this afternoon, um, to the extent that you can develop a structured environment uh, in your home and your school, uh, children with a variety of behavior problems, whether they have Jacobson or not, tend to be more responsive. And a structured environment is, is easy for some parents who are for highly organized themselves. Any engineers in the audience? <laughs> they, they seem to have no problem developing a structured environment. And then some of us who are less organized, you know, it, it's more of a challenge, but it's doable. It's doable for any family and it can affect all of these adverse behaviors. So I've been asked to talk about medication. That's, I think, why Paul invited me. Uh, but I must say, that's not the first thing I do when any of these behaviors present to me. The first thing I do is listen carefully and make sure I understand what the behaviors are, what the antecedents of the behaviors are, uh, and how the parents, teachers, or others respond to the behaviors, and then try to develop some behavior management programs uh, that can be effective. But we're not going to talk about that today. We want to talk about, I've been asked to talk about medication. Um, but before we prescribe medication, I always ask, what's the cause of the challenging behavior that the parent is presenting to me? Is it some abnormal aspect of the development of the child's brain? Either something that we can see grossly on an MRI or something that's uh, microscopic or molecular that we don't see with imaging, uh, but does suggest some abnormal transmission of brain impulses that makes that brain different? Are there environmental influences that are affecting the behavior? Because these are often changeable. Um, I think from the kind of research that Paul is describing, eventually some of these brain developmental problems might be alterable. But now, certainly we can alter the environment if that's influencing behavior, and it always is to various degrees. And third, very important, are there physical conditions causing secondary behavioral problems? And let me give you some examples of these. So there are many problems that all children have that make them irritable, or make them sad, or make them fussy, or make them inattentive. But when you have uh, intellectual deficiency, when you have an underlying uh, disorder of the brain that's associated with a variety of difficult to control behaviors, these common behavioral, pro these common physical problems can cause more behavioral problems. And it's very important for you as parents and your primary care clinician uh, to think about this before just assuming the behavior is a result of the deletion. Very important. For example, headaches. I mean, you all know as adults, when you have headaches, 
you're irritable, you're, you're sometimes aggressive, you're just off, you're not good with people, even the people you care about, right? So if a kid has a headache, the kid's the same way. And children with, with language problems, problems with expressive communication, are not gonna be able to tell you my head hurts. Now if you're lucky, you know, they'll go like this. Uh, or I often ask them to draw a picture, tell me what the headache feels like, if they have the ability to do that, and sometimes you get a clue. Or I tell, I'm asking, tell me what the pain feels like, how you're feeling, and they'll draw a picture of their head, and they'll, they'll, they'll have a hammer going down, like a migraine headache, or a band around the head. So that's a nonverbal clue that some kids can give. Uh, dental infections are often hidden, you know? I'm not talking about just the cavity but a little abscess, for example, or, or gum disease, and you have to look for that. I mean, a clinician, pediatrician has to tap on the teeth to see if there's tenderness and look carefully at the gums. And sometimes we just want to send them to a dentist, and it points out the importance of, of preventative dental visits as well. Certainly common ear infections are a problem, and in young children, they often don't pull at their ears, but they can have that bulging ear under a lot of pressure and be very irritable. Uh, and sometimes that can be chronic. Sinusitis, when the sinuses are infected, you know, we think of sinusitis as, oh, you're really sick, you got facial pain, you got junk coming out of your nose, you got a high fever, headache, but not always. It can be more subtle and it can be kind of a behavioral presentation affecting sleep, appetite, and, and play. Constipation turns out to be common in almost all children with brain-related developmental disabilities, but some more than the others. And my reading is that it is quite common in kids with, with, uh, with Jacobson syndrome. Uh, do you find that? Most of your, yeah, okay. So constipation, I mean, we've all experienced that at some time. It makes you feel miserable, right? You know, particularly if it's really stuck in there. And again, a child who is not verbal and can't express it, you know, it's like a, a toddler who's constipated. You don't know unless you think about it or think, oh my God, it's been a week or two weeks since she's had a stool. Reflux, which refers to gastroesophageal reflux where the uh, acid in the stomach moves upward in the esophagus tube where it doesn't belong and causes a heartburn effect and can cause other problems. But that heartburn effect can be quite painful. Even if it's just low grade and not so painful, it's continuous or, or intermittent, it's, and it can be, cause a lot of irritability and behavior problems. Uh, a kidney infection or bladder infection can be quite silent. You know, when the, when the child has burning on urination with fever, it's pretty obvious, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't. So as a pediatrician, you gotta get a urine sample and look. A hernia, you know, an inguinal hernia down here in the groin, uh, can be intermittent and cause pain, and you know, unless you look and examine the child, you don't know about this, and most parents aren't aware of it. And even skin infections, um, particularly, well, skin infections when they're boils, or abscesses particularly, or, or chronic things like eczema or atopic dermatitis can cause a lot of irritability, hyperactivity, sleep problems, etc. So, my point is that you should expect your primary care clinician to think of these kinds of things when you're, particularly when your child comes with a, a new behavioral pattern, okay? Think of these, these physical conditions. And this is just a study, not with kids with developmental disabilities. They're otherwise typically developing kids uh, six to 17 who had anxiety disorder. And this group looked at a lot of physical uh, uh, components that went along with anxiety. And you can see that three quarters of the kids had stomach aches and they were restless. Uh, half the kids had, they were, they were blushing, you know, kind of getting redness. They had palpitations, palpitations with, um, of their chest with rapid heartbeats. All these are physical symptoms that don't have underlying physical causes. They were related to the child's anxiety. You treat the anxiety and these physical or somatic symptoms resolve. So it reminds us the importance of paying attention to physical symptoms. Well, I'm not gonna spend time on this because you're gonna get this in the ne next lecture and this is just an approach, a behavioral approach uh, to, um, uh, to, to difficult and challenging behaviors. But let's talk about medications. 
Most medications that affect uh, behavior regulate brain chemistry in areas of the brain that cause specific behaviors. Now some are very specific to specific part of the brains, but the more we look, the more we find that certain areas of the brain that transmit nerve uh, impulses from nerve, one nerve to another are particularly associated with certain behaviors and the drugs we use for these uh, affect that part of the brain. It's important that the drugs that are prescribed for your children uh, have undergone what we call randomized controlled trials. So this is the gold standard of carefully uh, taking a group of children with the same problem, like 11Q, uh, with the same uh, a spectrum of a particular behavior, uh, and then randomizing them to those getting the drug and those getting a placebo, at least for a period of time when they're under study. And then you carefully look at these behaviors using standardized, valid, uh, validated uh, instruments at the behaviors. They're difficult to do, they're expensive, but that's the only way we really can determine the effectiveness of medication, uh, particularly for behavioral disorders. We have to know about the safety of the drug and, and to get FDA approval, they have to go through safety studies. Um, the amount of medicine is important. Um, I think the best physicians working with children with behavioral problems use these medicines and start very low in the doses and they slowly titrate up to an effective dose. So the dose your child may be getting initially may, may not see any response. Now hopefully your physician will tell you that. Uh, and then with, with careful phone communication and follow-up visits, we titrate to, a, to an optimal dose that has the least side effects. That's a general principle of using these medicines. Also, it's very important to know what we're treating. You know, if someone uh, says your kid has ADHD and wants to give you a, a medication like Concerta, well, what are you treating? You're not just treating ADHD, that's just a series of letters. You, you, you're treating certain behaviors that are really different in each child, at least the, 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 the profile of the behaviors are different in each child. And it's important to work with your physician and teacher, and if, with older children also, to know what the target behaviors are that you want to follow with this particular medicine. And in the beginning, it should just be anywhere from two or three behaviors at the most that you want to intensely follow to see if the medicine's working. So with ADHD, it might be um, uh, you know, sitting still for how many seconds or minutes, whatever, at the dinner table. You know, that could be a goal with ADHD. Uh, or, or going to bed when, when, when the child's asked to go to bed. That would be an attention uh, issue. Monitoring is very important, um, and that refers to follow-up. Uh, anytime a clinician prescribes a medicine for your child for a behavior, you want to know what the plan is for follow-up. When are they going to call you? When are they going to plan for visits? Because these medicines, you know, are powerful. They, they, they affect our brains, our children's brains, and we need follow-up. For example, when I have a new patient, even a typically developing patient with ADHD, and I start them on a stimulant medicine like one of the amphetamines or, or Ritalin concerted type drugs, I always call them in one to two weeks to see how things are going. Look for side effects, look for benefits. And I always see them at a minimum of one month, sometimes sooner, after follow-up. And then monthly after that for three months, and after that the visits are dependent on the, the, the course of the child. But you as a parent should know what the follow-up system is going to be. That's, it's very reassuring to know that, and that you, you, you've uh, worked that out with the clinician. <clears throat> so I would like to know from the group uh, what medicines your children are now receiving. Could you tell me? Yes. Dexedrine. Dexedrine, okay, probably for ADHD. That's an amphetamine. We tried just about everything, but what they're on right now is Vyvanse. We were on Risperdal, I had to go off of that. Um, clonidine, and uh, one of them's on Prozac. Okay, okay.
Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about all of those. Others, yes. Daytrana. Daytrana, okay. Do you know what, you know what Daytrana is used for? Attention. Attention, yeah, it's for ADHD. Yeah. Right, it's for ADHD. Right, uh, Daytrana is a, a variation. Uh, well, no, Daytrana is a patch. It's actually like methylphenidate or Concerta, Ritalin, but it's a patch that absorbs very slowly for kids that have trouble swallowing, particularly, but others. Other medications, yes? Clonidine. Clonidine, why is your child getting clonidine? Sleep, yeah, so that's the main reason to use clonidine, uh, both for sleep onset, but more important for frequent wakening up at night. It's for to go to sleep. He's too restless. He can't stay still. He's re restless. Does it help him to go to sleep? Yeah, he's and, never had a problem staying asleep. Oh, he never had a problem staying. Okay. No, he just, the moment he got tired. Did they ever try melatonin first? It, it worked for a bit, and then it just didn't work. Anymore. Okay, we'll talk about that. Yes. Uh huh. Okay, we'll talk about melatonin for sleep. Very important. That's one of the few over-the-counter medicines that is used for these these kinds of behavioral issues. Yeah. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Oxycarbazepine and Resperidone. Sure, re sure. Resperidol. Or res we're going to talk about that. Um, that's used for irritability and aggression primarily uh, in kids with autism. And yes. What's that? Guanfacine. Yes, okay. Guanfacine is an old drug. It actually was an antihypertensive drug when I was in medical school. But somebody discovered when they gave it to older people or adults with hypertension, it brought down the blood pressure, but it also made them less hyperactive and less aggressive. <laughs> and now it's more used for that. And trazodone. Why, do you, why trazodone? For sleeping also. So sleep is obviously a big issue that's not responding just to behavioral concerns. All right, let me go on. I wanted to get that uh, kind of sense of what, what you're using now. So as you heard that many children uh, have, a, many children with Jacobson syndrome have an associated form of ADHD, attention deficit uh, hyperactive disorder, which has three core symptoms when you have the full condition, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. There are some forms only with the inattention, but most kids, I think, with Jacobson probably have all, all three. Uh, it occurs 7% in typically developing kids, but you heard, you remember what the percentage was with Jacobson's this morning? I mean, it varied, actually. You know, anywhere from like a third to a half or above uh, have ADHD. Very important. So in the past, it was said that children with intellectual deficiency, with cognitive problems, you know, they're, they're all hyperactive. They're all impulsive. You can't diagnose ADHD. Well, they're not all hyperactive, and they're not all impulsive. You know, I always tell the residents, think of a child with Down syndrome who's kind of laid back and mellow, at least till adolescence. Uh, and yeah, even they get excited for an adolescence. But they certainly, most don't have ADHD. But some do, and some kids with Jacobson syndrome. And you can, clinicians can use the same criteria that we use with typically developing children to diagnose ADHD. That's very important. If your primary care doctor says, you know, gee, I, it's really tough to diagnose ADHD in these kids, please tell them that I said if they use the same criteria, and what most people are using now is the Vanderbilt rating scales for parents and children, uh, you can successfully make a diagnosis. Uh, or not of uh, ADHD. So these are the medications we use for ADHD, just to familiarize yourself with the names. The two most common are in the methylphenidate amphetamine category. These are stimulants. And they say, my God, a kid's hyperactive, why use a stimulant? But what it does is stimulates something called dopamine, primarily in the brain, to regulate dopamine so you're less hyperactive and less impulsive and less inattentive. And the two stimulants you'll see, and those are the brand names next to them. Concerta, Ritalin, and Daytrana, which you mentioned, and Adderall and uh, Vyvanse for am uh, amphetamines. Now interestingly, at least in typically developing kids, there's over 200 randomized controlled trials that show their effectiveness for ADHD, 200. And these are some of them that started 50 years ago. But we now have 
randomized controlled trials with these two stimulant drugs in kids with a number of uh, developmental disabilities. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I couldn't find one with Jacobson syndrome in particular, but that wouldn't be important to me because in so many others like Down syndrome and Williams syndrome and uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, these medicines have been shown to be effective when there's ADHD. And I mentioned three others that are not as used as often, atomoxetine, guanfacine, and even clonidine can be used primarily for ADHD. And the latter two have long-acting forms now. So anxiety, you know, I thought anxiety was more common in kids with Jacobson syndrome than was reported this morning. I think uh, the numbers were in the 10% uh, category. Now that's certainly more than the general population, but not that much more. How many of you have been told your child has anxiety? How many would you say your child has a lot of fears beyond, yeah, oh, okay, not, not that many, there's some. Okay, and that's what anxiety is. It's defined as excessive f fearfulness beyond uh, what you expect for that child's age. And there are many forms of anxiety. Uh, I'm not gonna go into those in, in detail since it doesn't seem to be as prominent. Uh, but anxiety and kind of an associated disorder, depression, often go together, not always, uh, but the medications we used are similar. Uh, and they're called uh, SSRIs, or serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Now I think this afternoon we're gonna have um, <clears throat> uh, a discussion uh, of these medicines, not specifically perhaps targeted at anxiety, but that's what they've been classically used for. My, my, my sense from reading the title is that uh, the hypothesis may be that there's, they're specifically targeted to the brains of children with Jacobson syndrome. But we in pediatrics and psychiatry uh, use these SSRIs for anxiety uh, and, and depression. Um, there's many d different drugs in the five most commonly uh, prescribed. I, I listed there with the uh, generic name or uh, the scientific name and then the brand name uh, next to that. Now, these, these are all safe if prescribed carefully and monitored carefully, uh, but there are side effects to all of these, as with any medicines. And, and they're common side effects, uh, but there's one that really has to be uh, monitored carefully, and that's behavioral agitation. So if we prescribe one of these SSRIs for a child who's anxious or depressed, and within the next several weeks, particularly a week or two after starting it, they get more agitated. Um, that could be the sign of a suicidal thinking. Not actually completing a suicide, but what's called suicidal ideation or thinking about suicide to the degree uh, your kids could be able to do that. And that would be a reason to either monitoring very carefully or considering stopping the medicine. <clears throat> we talked about aggression and irritability uh, as seen frequently in children on the autistic spectrum, but as we heard this morning, not all children on the autistic spectrum are aggressive by any means. Uh, just, not, just like not all children with the autistic spectrum have cognitive deficiency, but many, many have that. And we heard that about half of the children with the 11Q deletion have some degree of the autistic spectrum disorder. And I would, I would suspect, and certainly I've seen, that many of them uh, have some degree of irritability uh, or aggression. And it can be very difficult to treat behaviorally, although, again, that's the first approach. Uh, there are two medications that have received FDA approval on the basis of well done randomized controlled studies. You know, where they randomize a group getting the medicine, getting a placebo or, or a blank pill, follow them very carefully, uh, monitor behaviors carefully, and the two medicines that showed effectiveness in autistic kids with either irritability or aggression are um, Risperidone and Abilify. So these are the two that are prescribed most commonly, but they, they do have side effects. These kids can eat a lot and get obese. 
Uh, they can uh, uh, develop uh, uh, fatty livers. They can uh, have a tendency toward developing diabetes and high triglyceride levels. So all these things need to be uh, monitored. Uh, but not every day, not, not so frequently, uh, but they, they really do help children tremendously, at least many of the kids I have found are, are, are much less aggressive, much less irritable, uh, they learn better, they're more manageable at home and school and with other kids with these medications, but they do need careful monitoring. So we talked about sleep disturbances. How long do I have, Paul? Uh, 15 minutes. 15? 15 minutes ago. Oh, 15. I think you started about 11. That's fine, yeah. Oh, great, great. We'll, we'll, we'll be done soon. Okay, and then we'll have a panel, of course. Right, questions. right. Um, so there's different kinds of sleep disturbances, and that's what I was implying before. Uh, difficulty falling asleep or insomnia is one, and frequent night awakening is, is the other. So some kids have one or the other or both, and that's important to begin with when developing a behavioral plan, behavioral management, you would do it very differently and it's most behavioral managements are focused on the insomnia component, difficulty falling asleep at night. Um, again, look for physical conditions that might be causing this. Uh, does the child have a skin infection uh, or a urinary tract infection? Does the child have a hernia? Uh, is the child's mild cough from bronchiolitis or, or, or pneumonia during the day, causing more coughing at night, preventing adequate sleep. Um, is the environment dark enough to sleep? Uh, is the child having severe separation problems? So there's many things to look for uh, as underlying causes. Um, the medications, there, there, there are many medications that are used for sleep uh, problems for children and adults. I'm very cautious in using these with kids, uh, and I don't use them long term. I use them ideally to just kind of re uh, rework their sleep pattern, and once it's set, I try to taper them off if possible. Some kids do require these medicines, however, for a while. The most benign one is, is Benadryl. Uh, old-fashioned Benadryl, which you all know from your own childhood, which is kind of an anti-itching medicine. You use it for allergies and particularly itching, although it's also good for allergic rhinitis or hay fever. Uh, the problem with Benadryl is it causes sedation. Well, that's not a problem at night. Uh, and uh, it doesn't work with all children for sleep, for sleep onset, but it will with some and it's worth trying. However, about two to three percent of kids given Benadryl get very hyperactive. <laughs> so you never want to give it for the first time on an airplane. <laughs> you always want to give it the, what's that? We learned that. Yeah, well, your, your, your pediatrician should have warned you. I, that's a mantra for me. I always say that. Try it during the day sometime before the trip. Tom's forte does the same thing. What's that? Mm. Blend. It has uh, the same. My God, a side effect with a homeopathic medicine? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so Benadryl can be tried. Um, now melatonin uh, is, a, is a natural uh, medicine. It comes from the pineal gland in the center of the brain. And it's, it regulates our sleep. Mel you get a melatonin surge. Uh, in the brain and the blood at the time you go to sleep and it helps us to settle children and adults um, and giving a little melatonin as a pill uh, can be helpful uh, with many kids particularly with sleep onset problems it doesn't affect in most kids the frequent wakening up at night although sometimes it does help but mainly settling down if you're going to use melatonin you got to darken the room and you have to give it about 45 minutes before the expected time of sleep. And for young children, we usually start with a small amount, one or two milligrams, and usually go up to five milligrams, just one dose. With older children and adolescents, you can go to 10 milligrams. And there have been a number of studies, both in typically developing and atypically developing children, to show this effectiveness. I don't know if it's specifically been done in Jacobson's. I haven't seen that study. But it's been done you know, in a lot of kids with different uh, developmental disabilities. Was there a question? Mm 
Mm. Yeah, it's a relatively new preparation of slow release, and I don't have much experience with it personally. I, I've always prescribed the regular one, and uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it's not harmful in trying. I'd probably use the regular one first to see how that, that goes, but I would do that. I would dose it with your physician's uh, guidance. Okay, and so clonidine um, is a medicine that was used for a lot of other things, uh, but it is sedating. That's one of the side effects when you use it for other uh, conditions. Uh, and, um, but it's good at night to be sedating. So a modest dose of clonidine uh, uh, can, be, can be useful. Uh, the neurologists tend to use clonidine more. I kind of stick with melatonin if I can but clonidine can be very helpful to many children for sleep problems. Um, all medicines have potential side effects, uh, but most are manageable with changing the dose. It's very important when you, your child is prescribed a, medic, a new medication for a behavioral problem or sleep problem that your clinician goes over those side effects with you. Ideally, you write them down, or he or she writes them down, or you have a website, so you know what side effects to look for. But they all have side effects. Now, most kids, none of them have all the side effects on that list, and most of them are not too serious, and most of them are manageable. <clears throat> well, this is a... Um, uh, a quote from a novelist, James Adji, that I like for a lot of different talks I give, but certainly for parents, grandparents, uh, with, uh, with kids like you all that have an experience. So every child, in every child, the potentiality of the human race is born again. That's kind of a, as a pediatrician, a great mantra to, to use because it, um, it gives me a fresh way of thinking about every child and recognize these, the potential uh, of every child and recognize that I use all the knowledge I have uh, to try to make that child's life better. You've been a great audience. Um, I would, I think we have time for a few more questions or do you want to wait um, till the panel? I'd panel? defer that to the panel. Let's do that. That's okay because the pizza is here. Until oh, so. that's important. <laughs> what, what kind of pizza? Every kind. Oh, every kind. Every kind of pizza. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I sure wish I lived in San Diego.